Calaveras County is one of 58 counties located in the state of California. The county is blessed with beautiful landmarks, rolling foothills, and peaceful valleys. In 1848, gold was discovered in California, resulting in hundreds of thousands of immigrants descending into the state. It was 42 years before fortune seekers descended onto this land that the history of Calaveras County would begin. In the year 1806, a group of Spanish explorers led by Lieutenant Gabriel Morega set out to explore the vast, wide open areas of the San Joaquin Valley. As they made their way along the shoreline of what is now known as the Calaveras River, they found many skulls of Native Americans along the river banks. The human remains were of native Miwok people, killed by Spanish soldiers after the Miwoks banded together to rise against the missionaries. With the discovery of skulls, Gabriel Morega would name the river and the land in which it flowed, El Rio de las Calaveras a Spanish term for River of Skulls. After a number of changes in the county boundary lines, Calaveras County was organized in 1849 by the California State Legislature. Miwoks were Native Americans that were present in the area at the time. Their culture was documented by early explorers, settlers, and missionaries. The Miwok Indians occupied a large portion of the San Joaquin Valley, along with areas of the Sierra Nevada mountain range. Besides deer meat and fish, Miwoks relied on acorns and seeds for food. Acorns were cracked and shelled before they were ground into meal in mortar holes on limestone rocks. Diversity in the environment was important for the Miwok's survival. The Miwok Indians, their way of life and the land in which they lived would become only a memory in the history books as life throughout the West was about to change. January 1848, James Marshall and his work crew were building a sawmill for John Sutter along the American River near Sacramento. On the morning of January 24th, Marshall discovered a few ounces of gold along the river banks. For two months, James Marshall and his crew made efforts to keep their discovery a secret. As more and more gold was pulled from the river, news of the strike leaked out. And March 15th, the first printed notice of the discovery was published in the California newspaper in San Francisco, resulting in the largest human migration in history. Before Marshall's discovery, a handful of miners were pulling gold from the creeks and drainages throughout Calaveras County. The large number of new immigrants descending into the area were given the nickname 49ers, relating to the year of the gold rush. 
Among them were the Chinese. At first, the Chinese were accepted by almost everyone, as land, gold, and other resources were plentiful. The Chinese would make contributions to the economy of the western frontier, providing a source of inexpensive labor. They offered a wide range of services, providing laundry, garden vegetables, firewood, and domestic needs. Nine days after Marshall discovered gold, the war between the United States and Mexico ended. After Mexico handed California over to the U.S., a large number of Mexicans were allowed to remain in the state. Many of them headed for the foothills to search for gold. In 1849, slavery was still in place in the South. However, the majority of people in the northwestern states were against slavery. As a result, 1,000 blacks were free to descend into Calaveras County. As thousands of people descended into the county, mining camps soon dotted the landscape. Mining camps were temporary settlements at the vicinity of the mines and consisted of nothing more than a few tents and small wooden buildings. When the gold rush began, gold was free for the taking. There were no laws, private property, license fees, or taxes. The first judge to enforce a number of new laws in Calaveras County was William Thow Smith. Court was first held in a large tent located in Double Springs. Later, a small courthouse was erected from wood imported from China. Double Springs would be designated as the first county seat. In 1850, the county seat was moved to Jackson, where it remained for two years, before being moved to the robust community of McCallamy Hill. McCallamy Hill was named after the nearby McCallamy River and was the largest, richest, and most violent of the motherlode camps. In 1852, a portion of the hotel ledger served as the Calaveras County Courthouse. George W. Ledger acquired the court building and made it part of his adjoining hotel. Nearby stands the IOOF building. It was said to be California's first three-story building outside of the coastal towns. The Congregational Church in McCallamy Hill was organized in 1853. The building erected in 1856 is the oldest congregational church that is still in use. With no mining laws in place, prospectors set up temporary rules among themselves. The ground surrounding McCallamy Hill was so rich that mining claims were restricted to a piece of ground measuring 16 feet wide by 50 feet long. Gold was worth $21 an ounce, and these small claims were reportedly yielding up to $20,000 worth. The population in McCallamy Hill would exceed 12,000. Crime and unrest was escalating among miners, gamblers, fur traders, and thieves. One mile south of McCallamy Hill, immigrants from Chile took control of a five-mile gulch, which was the richest placer mining section in Calaveras County. Americans told the Chilean immigrants to leave the gulch within 15 days. Leading to much protest and violence, 
the so-called Chilean War resulted in several deaths and the removal of Chilean miners from the Gulch. By 1850, McCollumy Hill's reputation continued to decline. During one 17-week period, there was an average of one murder a week, and violence would only get worse. In less than a week, five murders took place, and the condition of affairs in the mining town had become unbearable. Town leaders decided in order to discourage crime was to erect a permanent gallows. No sooner was the scaffolding built, the first customer was led into it and hung. Before the rope was placed around his neck, the Mexican bandit confessed to killing eight people between McCollumy Hill and Angel's Camp. Angel's Camp is located 20 miles south of McCollumy Hill. In 1847, Sergeant James H. Carson and his regiment arrived in Monterey, California on the U.S. Lexington. In 1848, Carson heard of the fabulous finds in the Motherlode. The tales proved too strong a lure, so he formed the Carson Robinson Party and headed east for the mines. Members of the Carson Robinson Party included George Angel and his brother Henry Angel. As the party made their journey into Calaveras County, they started prospecting along the shoreline of a small foothill creek. Fed by seasonal runoff, the stream flowed eight months out of the year, and a two-mile stretch where the Angels brothers set up camp would adopt the name Angels Creek. While the Angels brothers remained at the creek site, the remaining explorers in the Carson party would continue their journey south. After a few weeks of this backbreaking labor, Henry Angel realized there were easier ways to make a living, and later that fall he gave up mining to open a trading post. At that time, the growing settlement changed the name from Angel's Creek to Angel's Trading Post. It wasn't until late 1848, when the town was founded, that it would adopt the name Angel's Camp. During the first few years, surface mining around Angel's Camp produced a significant amount of gold. In fact, the grounds were so rich that claims that produced two ounces of gold or less per day were ignored. However, after a few years of great prosperity, Angel's Camp began to fade away as the streams played out and could no longer provide the rich returns they once did. However, in 1850, things were about to change when an extensive gold-bearing quartz vein was located by the Winter Brothers. The massive vein ran underground along Main Street, continued westward for nearly 1,500 feet towards Altaville. The discovery of the vein resulted in a major boom. To retrieve gold from the vein, five mines were built. The Utica, Stickle, and Lighter Mine were the first to set up operation and were located on the west side of town. The Angels and Sultana Mine also ran along Main Street. Unlike placer mining, where prospectors used sluice boxes and gold pans, quartz mining or hard rock mining 
was a dangerous and expensive method of retrieving gold. Miners would dig out tunnels, then use explosives to break up the quartz rock. The loose rock was brought to the surface to be sorted, crushed, and washed. Gold was then extracted from the crushed ore. Miners were paid $1.50 per hour and worked 12-hour shifts. Angel's Camp grew quickly. Stores, homes, schools, and churches dotted the landscape as a population of 4,000 settled in to stay. Located on the northeastern corner of Main Street and Bird's Way was the Hotel Angels. The original eastbound road out of town ran down Bird's Way, crossed the creek and continued up the hill. Bird's Way was also known as Chinatown. Sam Choi was a Chinese merchant who ran a store there until the city purchased the building for use as a jail. In 1850, John Perano arrived from Italy and purchased a large piece of property on the corner of Bird's Way and built the town's first general store. Olivia Rolleri arrived from Italy in 1860 and would become the county's most prominent businesswoman. Olivia established the Calaveras Hotel. Located in Angel's Camp, the boarding house contained more than 30 rooms, a butcher shop, saloon, and barber shop all under one roof. Over the years, her success paid off. Olivia bought property on both sides of the hotel. She invested in the gold mines and purchased hundreds of acres of land east of Angel's Camp. In 1848, when James Carson left the Angels Brothers at Angels Creek, the remaining party would split up. A group of men led by the Murphy Brothers headed further up Angels Creek to search for gold, while Carson continued south. Carson and his men were five miles south of Angels Camp when they stopped to look for color in a small tributary of the Stanislaus River. The small stream was incredibly rich in gold. The tributary was quickly named Carson Creek. Carson Hill's great fame would not come from placer mining in the nearby creeks, but from the rich quartz loads found in the nearby hills. A miner named John William Hance discovered a 14-pound quartz rock laced with gold on what would later be known as Carson Hill. Hance quickly staked a claim. He took on a group of partners and the claim would be known as the Morgan Mine. While working the quartz vein at the Morgan mine, miners would often use explosives. After the explosion, they would simply walk around and pick up the gold. November 1854, a blast exposed one of the largest masses of gold and quartz ever found in California. Weighing in at 195 pounds, the mass was worth $43,000. This is a mere fraction of today's value of $4,680,000. Gold production from the Morgan mine declined in the late 1850s, and the mine was sold to the Maloney's mine, which was located along the Stanislaus River. The Maloney's mine employed advanced mining methods and worked on a major scale from 1889 to 1918. With the number of mines working the area, 
the population of Maloney's and Carson Hill combined reached nearly 5,000. Not to be outdone by the rest of the Carson Robinson party, John and Daniel Murphy were finding good color in Coyote Creek four miles east of Angel's Camp. They would christen the site Murphy's Diggins. The Murphy brothers spent only a few months at Murphy's Diggins. They packed up and headed four miles east to start a new claim known as Murphy's. The original claim of Murphy's Diggins stood idle, but not for long. Mexican miners began drifting into the camp and would change the name to Vallecito, meaning small valley. They built stone and adobe buildings and Vallecito began to grow. The Dinkelspiel family, who had recently immigrated from Germany, built and occupied the Dinkelspiel store. The original Union Church would be built on the corner of Carson and Church Street. In an old oak tree near the church hung the old miner's bell. The bell was used to call people together for many purposes. In 1853, the old miner's bell was cast in Troy, New York, placed on a ship, traveled around the Horn, and ended up in San Francisco Bay. Early residents purchased the bell from the ship and brought it to Vallecito. While the gold mining town of Vallecito was booming, the Murphy brothers were busy striking it rich four miles to the east. Many fortunes were made in Murphy's. One winter, more than five million in gold was taken from a four-acre mining claim just south of the town. From 1850 to 1860, Wells Fargo would transport fifteen million dollars worth of gold from the area. Murphy's was rich. John Murphy opened a trading post, which reportedly did better than many nearby claims. Some days saw as much as $400 in gold dust being traded for food and supplies. John Murphy had a way with the local Miwok Indians and was very successful in getting them to work for him. A number of the Indians adapted well into a new foreign culture. During its peak, Murphy's was home to several thousand people. The Mitchler Hotel was first opened in 1856 and was the natural stopover for the Madison stage. In 1859, most of Murphy's was damaged by fire. The Mitchler Hotel was protected because of its stone construction and iron shutter doors. In 1945, the Mitchler Hotel's name was changed to the Murphy's Hotel. In 1860, the Murphy's Grammar School was built for the total cost of $4,000. A former student was Dr. Albert Michelson, who lived in Murphy's as a boy. In 1907, Michelson was honored with the first Nobel Prize in Physics. In 1926, Dr. Michelson performed an experiment using mirrors to measure the speed of light. Michelson's experiment influenced Dr. Albert Einstein to develop his theories on relativity. In the summer, Murphy's Creek would dry up, leaving the mining companies without water. In an effort to solve the problem, 25 miners would form the Union Water Company. The company operated from a small wooden building on Main Street. 
Under the guidance of T.J. Madison, the construction of a wooden flume would begin in 1850. Their goal was to divert water from the Stanislaus River, located 15 miles up country. To construct a flume from that distance over rugged mountain terrain required courage and skill. The canal was pushed to completion in the later part of 1852. There was great rejoicing among miners, for now the future of their mines was assured. During the construction of the flume, Augustus T. Dowd, an employee of the Union Water Company, shot and wounded a grizzly bear while hunting in the forest near the headwaters of the flume project. While tracking the bear, he wandered into unfamiliar territory and made an amazing discovery. Dowd found himself staring up at a monstrous redwood tree. He was so awed by the size of the tree that all thoughts of the wounded bear were forgotten. Days later, he led a group of skeptics to his discovery. The world learned of the massive grove of trees, which would be known as Sequoia giganteas. To determine the age of these gentle giants, five men from Murphy's decided to cut down the largest tree in the grove. It took 22 days to complete the task. Having braved the fires, wind, and storms for nearly 3,000 years, the huge redwood tree was forced by man to tremble and fall. The sound of the sequoia hitting the ground could be heard for a distance of 10 miles. The giant was 302 feet tall, with a circumference of 96 feet. Growth rings determined the tree to be 2,800 years old. Over the years, the large stump of the falling tree served as the foundation for a gazebo, which included a bar and dance floor. In 1931, California took possession of the redwoods and the thousands of acres of forest that surrounded them and established Big Tree State Park. For visitors to access the park, a road was constructed for Murphy's in 1857. Following the old immigrant trail, Major John Ebbets would continue the road over the Sierra Nevada mountains. The early wagon roads in Calaveras County were few and difficult. The first and most traveled was from McCallamy Hill to Stockton. Additional roads branched out throughout the county, allowing wagons and stagecoaches to travel from town to town. The San Joaquin Sierra Nevada Railroad was incorporated in 1882 to connect the growing population of Calaveras County to the deep water ports in San Francisco. The railroad stretched from the San Joaquin Delta to the foothill town of Valley Springs. For 40 years, the train depot in Valley Springs was the end of the line. At the depot, the Southern Pacific unloaded passengers and supplies. Besides a train depot, the main street of Valley Springs consisted of a livery stable, store, five bars, and a post office. In 
The Angels branch of the Sierra Railway left the main line at Jamestown in Tuolumne County, crossed the Stanislaus River, and continued on to Carson Hill and Angels Camp. The Angels Jamestown Railway did not generate enough revenue for its investors, and the line was abandoned in 1936. While gold in California was headline news, the discovery of copper would also contribute to the amazing history of Calaveras County. Hiram Hughes was fed up with the mines in Nevada and headed for the mother lode to seek his fortune. Hiram staked a claim on Quail Hill where he turned up small amounts of gold and silver. While playing on nearby Hog Hill, Hiram's 10-year-old son William Hughes stumbled onto vast amounts of iron rust ore. Hiram sent a sample to San Francisco to be analyzed. The ore was found to contain a high copper content worth $120 per ton. Skeptics, miners, and merchants headed for what would be known as Telegraph City, and the copper rush was on. Six miles east of Telegraph City, William Reed and Thomas McCarty established the Keystone and Union Mines. One year later, the community that developed around the strikes became known as Copperopolis. During the copper boom, the main street of Copperopolis was lined solid with buildings of all shapes and sizes, offering the population of 7,000 anything they might desire. Copperopolis owed much of its prosperity to the Civil War, as tremendous amounts of copper were needed by the Union Army for shell casings. The shells, bullets, and munitions were so important that Copperopolis was the only town west of the Mississippi to build an armory to house and train Union guards at the time of the war. In 1863, William Reed built a number of roads allowing mule and ox teams to haul $1.6 million of copper from the local mines in the first year. When the Civil War ended, the price of copper fell from 55 cents per pound to 19 cents, and the future of copper mining looked grim. And by 1867, the copper mines lay idle. During the copper boom, the town of Copperopolis attracted people of all walks of life, and the old corner saloon located on Main Street was visited by a number of shady characters. In the 1880s, a photograph taken inside of the saloon captured one of the most famous people to visit Calaveras County. Standing among the customers wearing a black trench coat was Charles Bowles. The black hat and trench coat worn by Charles Bowles would give him the nickname Black Bart. Throughout the state of California, Black Bart robbed the Wells Fargo Stagecoach Company 28 times. Two of the robberies were in Calaveras County. Bart's region of terror lasted the better part of a decade because no one could identify this mysterious lone bandit who robbed the Wells Fargo stages all by himself. Without a horse, Black Bart would walk to his crimes carrying an old rusty shotgun that wouldn't even shoot. Black Bart would frequently create decoy gunmen for backup. He would place wooden sticks on nearby boulders to simulate their rifles. 
The Wells Fargo Company posted a $1,000 reward for the arrest and conviction of Mr. Bowles. The morning of November 3, 1883, Reason McConnell, a stagecoach driver for the Wells Fargo Company, was hauling $5,000 worth of gold dust and coins. Along for the ride was 19-year-old Jimmy Rolleri. Jimmy was the son of the prominent businesswoman Olivia Rolleri. As the stagecoach climbed Funk Hill near the Stanislaus River, Jimmy jumped from the coach with his Henry rifle in hand to do some hunting in the nearby bushes. As the stagecoach reached the top of Funk Hill, Black Bart stepped out from behind a tree, raised his shotgun, and stopped the stage in its tracks. While Bart was taking the riches from the strongbox, Jimmy Rolleri emerged from the bushes. And as soon as Bart laid eyes on the armed teenager, he dove into the underbrush and ran for his life. McConnell grabbed Rolleri's rifle and fired two shots at the fleeing bandit. The two rounds missed. Rolleri convinced McDonald to let him shoot. Jimmy fired once, hitting Bart in the hand. Black Bart would escape. However, he left behind some incriminating evidence. Most damaging was a handkerchief with a San Francisco laundry mark identifying Mr. Bowles. Wells Fargo Detective Jim Hume, along with Calavera Sheriff Ben Thorne and three other detectives, took 13 days to track down Black Bart. On November 17, 1883, Charles Bowles, a.k.a. Black Bart, sat in the Calaveras County Courthouse with his wounded hand, where he received a sentence of six years behind bars at San Quentin State Prison. As a reward, Wells Fargo presented Jimmy Rolleri with a brand new Winchester rifle. The lawman that slapped the handcuffs on Black Bart was Calaveras County Sheriff Ben Thorne. Ben Thorne worked out of the courthouse in San Andres and was elected county sheriff for 35 consecutive years. In 1863, the county seat was moved from Acolomy Hill to the community of San Andres, where it remains to this day. In 1861, the county built a brick Gothic mansion for Ben Thorne and his wife Annie Meeks. In 1855, a young writer named Bret Hart arrived in Calaveras County to see what life was like among the mining camps. Bret Hart found the gold country hard and lawless. He found the people ugly, unwashed, and vulgar. But his experiences left him rich with inspiration. Bret Hart would move to San Francisco and begin to write about the gold rush. The Luck of Roaring Camp and Outcast a Poker Flat were two famous books that were inspired by his experiences in the motherlode. While living in San Francisco, Bret Hart met another young writer named Samuel Clemens. Samuel Clemens was born in Florida in the year 1835. At age 18, Clemens traveled to St. Louis and Chicago, where he worked as a journeyman printer. In 1857, 22-year-old Samuel Clemens took a job as a steamboat pilot on the Mississippi River. It was at this time Clemens would take the pen name of Mark Twain. Mark Twain was a riverman's term for 12 feet deep. 12 feet of water was needed for safe navigation. 
1862, it seemed profitable for Mark Twain to head for California. Bret Hart's stories convinced Mark Twain to visit the Motherlode. So Twain boarded a train and headed for the mines. Arriving in Tuolumne County, Mark Twain met William and James Gillis. The Gillis brothers invited Mark Twain to stay at their cabin on Jackass Hill. Twain would spend three months as a guest at the cabin, sharing living quarters with the Gillis brothers and their cat, Tom Quartz. On a rainy day in February, Mark Twain was visiting friends in Angel's Camp. As he sat in the Angel's Hotel Saloon swapping stories, Mark Twain first heard the tale of a jumping frog. Inspired by the story, he returned to the Gillis cabin, where he put ink to paper making notes and sketches from the tall tale. Later, Mark Twain would write a short story about the jumping frog, which would bring him worldwide fame. Mark Twain died April 21, 1910. While he was in Calaveras County for only three months, his visit left a deep impression on himself and the county. Though the first county fair was held in 1893, the first Jumping Frog Jubilee did not take place until 1928. 15,000 visitors gathered to celebrate the area's amazing Gold Rush heritage. Main Street was closed to traffic to allow bullfrogs to jump from one street corner to another. With the exception of 1933 during the Great Depression, the Calaveras County Jumping Frog Jubilee would become an annual event. In 1938, the annual county fair and Jumping Frog Jubilee were combined and celebrated at the nearby fairgrounds known as Frogtown. In 1857, prospectors continued to arrive in Calaveras County to seek their fortune. However, placer mining had played out and there was little gold to be found. For the most part, the gold rush was over. Thousands of delusioned immigrants would simply turn around and head home with little to show for their effort. Thousands of wary individuals would pack up and make the two-day trip to San Francisco. San Francisco, for its part, developed a bustling economy and became California's central metropolitan city of the new frontier. Other miners would send for their families and turn to cattle ranching, farming, and other businesses for their survival. For the 50,000 fortune seekers who descended into Calaveras County between 1849 and 1855 would either prosper or go hungry. Either way, for the 49ers who survived the gold rush, their experience was nothing less than a grand adventure that they would never forget. For James Marshall, whose handful of gold would create worldwide news, made very little off his discovery. James Marshall was broke and ended up dying discouraged and bitter over the way his life turned out.
Today, the miners, trappers, fur traders, and bandits that walk the streets of the gold rush towns are gone. The buildings built of stone, brick, and wood remain. The hotel ledger in McCallamy Hill looks exactly as it did in 1851, despite the damage it received in the late 1800s from three separate fires. After burning to the ground, the Congregational Church has been rebuilt on the original foundation and remains one of the most attractive churches in the Motherlode. On Highway 49, at the site of the Chilean War, stands California State Landmark 265. After the Americans removed the Chilean immigrants from the Gulch, Miners discovered one of the largest gold-bearing quartz rocks that was ever found in Calaveras County. Located on Highway 12, the community of Valley Springs consists of restaurants, stores, real estate offices, and service stations. In the center of these commercial businesses stands the historical Valley Springs Train Depot. The 127-year-old depot is the only original station of the San Joaquin Sierra Nevada Railroad that is still standing. San Andres, the county seat, is home to 2,800 residents. On the narrow corridor of Main Street, History is frozen in time. The old courthouse building was built in 1867 and served the public until 1966. It was in this building that highwayman Black Bart was tried and convicted of the robbery of the Wells Fargo stage. Housed inside the courthouse, the county museum stores and displays a number of historical artifacts. Nearby, a stone building houses and maintains the county archives and makes them available for public use and education. When Thomas McCarty and William Reed opened the Union Mine to extract copper, the population of Copperopolis soared to 7,000. Today, the quiet little community of 3,600 live alongside old historical buildings which have survived the test of time. The armory which housed the Union Army Guards still stands along Main Street. The doors of the old corner saloon remain open to the public. The saloon has been serving customers for 150 consecutive years. Home to one of the largest collections of historical artifacts is the Angels Camp Museum. The three-acre site was once the location for one of Angels Camp's most productive quartz mines. Visitors can view steam engines, carriages, wagons, ore carts, and a variety of equipment that was used to remove and process millions of dollars of gold from the nearby mines. Today, the population of Angels Camp is half of what it was in 1850. A number of old historical buildings stand along Main Street. The Angels Hotel has seen a number of businesses come and go. It was in this building that Mark Twain was inspired by the story of a jumping frog. The loud, bustling little street known as Chinatown has been blocked off, leaving what is known today as Bird's Way a quiet, shaded, peaceful little dead-end street. Just south of Bird's Way, through traffic to Murphy's and Big Tree State Park, crosses over Angels Creek by the way of the Angels Bridge. 
September 2012, thousands of people gathered on the main street of Angels Camp to celebrate the 100-year anniversary of the town being incorporated. Built along Coyote Creek, the quiet little community of Valacito is home to 450 residents. Over the years, the Dinkelspiel store has served as headquarters for the Wells Fargo Company, a real estate office, store, and saddle shop. Today, the building is a historical landmark which consists of a business and private residence. In 1939, during a winter storm, the tree alongside the Union Church, which held the miner's bell, fell to the ground. The bell that called town folks together for 86 years now stands atop a stone monument in front of the little Union Church. No other gold rush town in Calaveras County has changed more than the community of Murphy's. For more than 100 years after the gold rush ended, Murphy's was a quiet, peaceful little town. In the 1980s, Murphy slowly transformed into a major tourist area. Today, both sides of Main Street are crowded with shops, restaurants, and galleries. Tourists browse through businesses located in well-preserved buildings that are over 160 years old. The Murphy's Hotel still serves as a hotel, bar, and restaurant, just as it did in 1856. One can only imagine how the history of Calaveras County would have played out if the cry for gold was not heard from Sutter's Mill in 1848. While gold is nothing more than a heavy metal, its value made the county what it is today. Gold pans and mines in the past have only scratched the surface of the motherlode soil. 80% of the gold remains hidden among the hills, drainages, forests, and streams that make up Calaveras County's natural wonders. <laughs> 